Good morning. My name is Li Chen. I'm the director of the China Center at the Brookings Institution. It's a great honor and a privilege for me to take part in this uh, fireside chat with the Honorable Ma Yingzhou, a great Taiwanese leader, a longtime dear friend, born in Hong Kong, having grown up in Taiwan, having received the law degrees from National Taiwan University, NYU, and the Harvard University. And uh, he served as Minister of Justice and the Mayor of Taipei. He was elected as the President of Taiwan, or Republic of China, Taiwan, in 2008, with 58% uh, of vote, the highest percentage in history, and was re-elected as President of Taiwan in 2012 for another four-year term. Among his numerous achievements during his uh, legendary political career, he was particularly known in safeguarding women's rights in Taiwan and his historical meeting with PRC President Xi Jinping in Singapore in November 2015. This event eight years ago shows convincingly that the peace and the stability across the Taiwan Street um, is attainable. And that meeting, by the way, was the first um, in between the top leaders of Taiwan and, and, and China uh, in 66 years. And uh, so um, the Honorable Ma Ying-jeou, it's really wonderful to have you here at the Dafia Economic Forum and uh, uh, really to share your well-positioned perspective and also insights with the European audience. Do you have any opening remarks before I post in a few questions? Oh, yes, I do. Uh, Professor Lee, ladies and gentlemen, tomorrow morning I will be leaving here for Taiwan, Republic of China. I want to take this opportunity to thank Delphi Economic Forum for inviting us to come. I also want to thank Her Excellency Katarina Sakaraboro, President of the Hellenic Republic, for apologizing to me for the Delphi Economic Forum's mistake in changing my title from former President of Republic of China on Taiwan to leader of Taipei City. <laughs> I accepted her apology, her goodwill, and wish her well. Thank you. Well, that makes us even more appreciate your presence here and you own your well-deserved respect. Now, exactly one month ago, uh, precisely, from March 27 to April 7, you had a really historical trip to China. And uh, could you tell us why you made this trip? And uh, what are the observations and the thoughts uh, you gained from that trip? Any um, highlights or uh, surprises? Oh, yes, I do. The purpose of this trip was twofold. The first was to visit and pay tribute to my grandfather's tomb in Xiangtan County, Hunan Province. He passes away in 1927, and my family moved to Taiwan in 1950. Uh, the Chinese, including the Taiwanese, attach a lot of importance to monitoring, to, to honoring their ancestors. This is an old Chinese tradition that has already lasted for at least 3,000 years. The second is to lead a group of 30 students and professors from Taiwan to meet their counterparts in three Chinese mainland universities, namely Wuhan. Hunan and Fudan universities. Both purposes were well achieved by this trip. The three face-to-face -face meetings between college students from Taiwan and men in China went very well. They got along with each other warmly. We hope to invite men and students to visit Taiwan in the coming uh, months and let Taiwan students play host for their reunion. 
In both urban and rural environment, developments in mainland China over the last 20 years have been impressive. High rise, 40 story buildings surround almost every large city. These buildings obviously ease the pressure of the first population growth uh, for some, to some extent. And small farm houses scattered along the high speed rail lines also look good. The state of heavy industry in Hunan was totally beyond my expectations because Hunan, my parents' home province, has been noted for centuries as a major producer of rice and other agricultural products in, Chinese, in China. Besides, I was also impressed by the PRC's extensive high-speed rail network of 40,000 kilometers. It runs at a very fast speed of 350 kilometers or 219 miles per hour. That is quite, uh, that is quite unstable. The total length is the longest in the world. Mainland China's high-speed rail seems to be uh, as good as those of Germany and Japan. Some people believe mainland China is even better. Uh, officials we met, particularly their local party secretaries, were mostly well-educated. Some had PhD degrees, and they were, by and large, friendly and confident in their conversation with us. Taiwan students in our group found their mainland Chinese counterparts warm and sociable. They met and quickly exchanged their contact information and communication later. We plan to invite them to visit Taiwan in the coming summer. We made the trip because exchanges between young people of the two sides of the Taiwan Strait are critically important for cross-strait relations for obvious reasons. Our future belongs to young people, after all. Education exchanges programs in, in the past between mainland China uh, and Taiwan once attracted a lot of mainland students, but they have been seriously disrupted by the coronavirus in the last few years and the DPP government's lukewarm support to getting them start, restarted. The Ma Injo Foundation simply wanted to take the first step to get exchange program running vigorously again. Wow. Well, this reminds me of uh, former president of the US, Obama, also said that one of the most impressive things in China is the high speed railroad. And also that the, the local leaders, the party secretary met during your trip, uh, like a Chongqing party secretary Yang, Yuan Jiajing is a local scientist, mm -hmm. and uh, Funan party secretary is a medical doctor, and uh, received some training abroad um, in the United States. And the Shanghai party secretary spent 10 years in the UK. He got his PhD from Imperial College, mm -hmm. and um, uh, um, really, um, uh, kind of an environmental scientist. Now, this is quite optimistic, but I want to move to a different direction, look at the not so optimistic view. This is a, there's a widely circulated narrative in the West, especially in the United States, where I'm from. It's a narrative that today's Ukraine is, Thai, is Taiwan's tomorrow. Now, I, based on my observation, um, that narrative actually is not uh, well resonated, uh, when most of Taiwanese, including yourself, you strongly oppose this fatalistic, highly insensitive narrative. Now, why do you believe that uh, this perception does not fit the reality or the situation of Taiwan? Well, uh, the, the cross Taiwan Strait relations between mainland Chinese and Taiwan enter into a new era in 1992, when the two sides reach <coughs> the 92 consensus on November 16, 1992. Under the 1992 consensus, uh, <coughs> uh, under the 92 consensus, both sides of Taiwan Strait adhere to the one China principle in their respective constitutions, yet they may each orally express their own interpretations of what the one China means. The 92 consensus seeks the two sides common ground, <clears throat> but 
to, uh, reserving their differences, and it has worked very well for the two sides for 31 years. Meanwhile, the 92 consensus was based on the ROC constitution as revised in 1991, which divided the national territory into two areas, <clears throat> namely the Taiwan area and the mainland area, and provides that the rights and duties of the people of the Taiwan area and of the mainland area may be provided for in a special act governing the relations between the people of Taiwan area and the people of the mainland area. And that law is called uh, <clears throat> the cross Strait People's Relations Act for short. The constitution of the ROC on Taiwan can therefore be called a one China, two area constitution. The 92 consensus is closely related to the ROC's constitution. By the way, President Tsai Ing-wen of the Republic of China has said on two occasions in the last three years that the PRC and ROC do not belong to each other. She has actually violated Article 11 of our Constitution as revised in 1991 and Article 2 of the cross Strait People's Relations Act. She has both broken her uh, <clears throat> commitment made when she was sworn in as president in 2016 to obey the Constitution and he, she, he has, she has made no correct corrections and apologies so far for the constitutional violations. There is no such mechanism between Russia and Ukraine because they are two independent countries in international law, while Taiwan and mainland are not. Therefore, the two cases are fundamentally different <clears throat> uh, and the consensus serves as a guardrail for the two countries. The existence of the United Consensus uh, serves as a guardrail for cross-strait peace. However, the fact that the DPP, uh, currently the ruling party in Taiwan, has so far refused to accept the 92 consensus. This posture complicated the picture of cross-strait peace. So it remains to be seen whether the DPP <clears throat> will change its non-acceptance policy in the future. If not, then the cross-strait peace will be difficult to come by because the DPP's policy could likely provoke conflict or even war across the Taiwan Strait. So this is the most critical element to watch in cross-strait relations. Well, it's a fascinating from, uh, you speak, uh, this is a, a comment from you. And uh, I know that uh, you helped establish the uh, mainland affairs department or ministry when, uh, so uh, in 1992, such a consensus were built. Uh, are, were you in the government? Mm. Uh, yeah, 92, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay, great. Now, you mentioned about the guardrail. Uh, this also reminds me that uh, to a certain extent, it's not only um, the, that aspect, the, the, but also probably reflect the tensions between United States and China. And we look at the Taiwan issue, right? China's ever-growing power but also growing fear on the part of the United States. Now, what do you think that uh, how, how much role that plays? And uh, to a certain extent, uh, China and Russia are different. Russia is a declining state that uh, suffer, you know, from the post-Cold War era, lost its age. China is a rising power, benefited greatly from the post-Cold War era, especially economic globalization. Now, do you think, uh, um, is that the differences between China and Russia also play a different role in terms of the narrative? Today's Ukraine, tomorrow's Taiwan. What's your comment? Uh, I basically uh, agree with your analysis about Russia and then in China. Uh, this is why I believe to avoid the war in the Taiwan Strait, Taiwan should take the initiative to have a dialogue with Beijing on issues of mutual concern particularly on the ways and means to avoid war in the Taiwan Strait. When I was president of the Republic of China during 2008 to 2016, all my ministers and had direct communication channels with their counterparts in the Chinese mainland to handle issues of mutual concern. By doing so, 
we were able to solve many problems we face. Well, uh, again, this comes to the, the central part of the issue. Do you really think the status quo can be maintained? Or there's any uh, mechanism or peace initiative you would propose at this critical moment uh, in the region? Do you have any comment on that? Well, uh, I'm very confident that the status quo can be maintained because I did exactly that when mm -hmm. I was uh, uh, president of the Republic of China from 2008 to 2016. Taiwan signed 23 agreements with the mainland covering almost all walks of life. And Mr. Xi Jinping and I, and I had a meeting for three hours in Singapore on November the 7th, 2015. We agreed to solve our dispute by peaceful means and meet again in the future. An editorial in the Economist magazine said, this meeting was the biggest concession the mainland China has made to Taiwan since the 1980s. But when I stepped down as president in 2016, and the Democratic Progressive Party, the DPP, Chairwoman Tsai Ing-wen took over as president, almost everything in cross-strait policy changed for the worse. Taiwan has, according to the economists, in May 2021, become the most dangerous place on earth. This is, it is clear that making peace across Taiwan Strait is not impossible, but it is certainly difficult. And Taiwan's attitude regarding the 92 consensus is the key to success. The current DPP government has, to, has so far refused to accept the 1992 consensus. As a result, the future of cross-street peace becomes very uncertain, if not outright bad. Well, uh, do you have any suggestions for Washington, you know, where I'm from? What's the wise uh, approach, you know, as you describe the, the uh, increasing tensions um, over the Taiwan Strait. So what's your uh, suggestion for Washington policymakers? I think Washington should encourage my country, Republic of China and Taiwan, to start negotiating peace with mainland China. That is probably the only solution. Well, okay. Um, we have a lot of Americans. Also, I want to make sure that we leave some time for questions from our audience, if possible. Now, many analysts also emphasize the generational change in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. uh, young Taiwanese do not identify themselves as a Chinese. Uh, there's a certainly lack of this kind of cultural identity or, or even sense of history. So what's your suggestion on, in this area in terms of Beijing, what Beijing should do, what Taiwan should do on that challenge? Uh, I think you're quite right. I, I generally agree with your uh, analysis. But I think the most important thing is to, to increase the contact between the two sides of the Taiwan Strait. So more talks, more uh, visits, and uh, more understanding will certainly change their uh, attitude toward the relations across the Taiwan Strait. Uh, you made a reference a few times about the DPP. And this reminds me that uh, next January, Taiwan will have another election. Mm -hmm. So could you tell uh, this audience uh, the differences or similarities between DPP and your party, KMT? Mm -hmm. Well, as a political party that supports Taiwan's independence, the Democratic Progressive Party, the DPP, has taken a confrontational policy toward the Chinese mainland, which strongly opposes Taiwan's uh, independence. Uh, you know, it's actually in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Not the majority of the people support the Taiwan independence. And this policy is also vehemently opposed by mainland China and disapproved by the United States. So I think if they continue to insist on the uh, Taiwan independence policy, I think it's very difficult to maintain peace in the Taiwan Strait. Do you have any comment on the possible candidates from, from DPP? Well, <laughs> that's a secret. Okay. <laughs> uh, 
um, the, do you think that uh, sounds like uh, Mr. Lai Ching there will be the candidate? Do you have any particular? No, he's already the candidate. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, no specific comment on uh, him. Well, our party's candidate has not come out yet, so I keep silent for the moment. Okay. Okay. Got it. Now it appears that the the you know the state stakes of Taiwan Street, particularly in light of the election, is very high, and it will affect the regional stability and maybe even peace. So uh, even you know, beyond this kind of security concern, uh, Europe has a huge interest over uh, the Taiwan Strait, mm -hmm. because as you know, that we have a strong economic ties with both Beijing and the Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And uh, would you please comment on the economic ties between mm -hmm. Europe, especially EU, and also Taiwan? Well, actually, uh, the trade volume between Taiwan and Europe continue to grow. Uh, and uh, this is the reason why uh, recently 16 out of uh, 27 members of the EU, or 60% of them, have established trade or other offices in Taiwan. In 2021, Taiwan mainly imports machinery uh, and chemicals uh, from the, the EU. So I think the trade volume will continue to grow. So this is something we uh, attach a lot of hope. Oh, that's uh, certainly that uh, this data itself is very, very interesting. Taiwan is a huge economy. Now we have about seven minutes left and uh, the floor is open. We will take uh, maybe one or two questions. Uh, the first one in the back, please. Uh, please also identify yourself. Microphone over there. Oh, probably use the microphone, yeah. Ni hao. Thank you. Uh, thank you, former president. And uh, uh, my name is Dimitri Lilkov. I'm part of the Wilfred Martin Center for Urban Studies in Brussels. I would like to touch upon the topic of the Taiwanese elections next year, nearly 24. So can you please comment? Should we, we be worried about potential signs of aggression coming from mainland China, given the history in the 90s and 2000s of mainland Chinese direct or indirect intervention in the whole process in Taiwan? through military intervention or aggression, cyber attacks or disinformation? Should we be worried about Chinese behavior before the elections? Thank you very much. Um, this is one question. We will take another question. Yes, please, gentlemen. Yes, thank you. Stephen Keating from the United States of America. Um, the analogy was made in terms of Ukraine now, uh, Taipei next. But I want to ask the question about the analogy of Hong Kong then, Taipei next. How do you, Mr. President, view developments in Hong Kong over the years as a potential indicator um, of Taiwan, mainland China relations? Thank you. Yeah, please. Well, uh, I have to tell you, I was born in Hong Kong, <laughs> but I don't want to Taiwan become the second Hong Kong. Uh, Actually, Hong Kong is very different from Taiwan. Not only the popu population, the area, but Hong Kong didn't have a dem democracy. They did have rule of law, but so it's very different from Taiwan. Taiwan has become a democratic society for over 30 years. And anything you want to change the Taiwan's current status must be peaceful and democratic meaning that it has to get the consent of the people. Otherwise, Taiwanese people would not accept to any change in this regard. The early question about uh, China's possible reaction about the Taiwan election. Uh, of course, many China always uh, believe that uh, they could uh, use force to, uh, uh, <clears throat> against Taiwan. But at this moment, I don't think they are uh, they're ready to do that, not only because uh, the international situation is quite different, and partic particularly any such move will certainly break the current uh, status between Taiwan and mainland China. And this status takes us uh, 30 years to establish. So that, sh that decision will uh, cast a lot of a post to mainland China and Taiwan. 
So I don't believe that mainland China at the moment is uh, planning to conquer Taiwan. So uh, we welcome you to be concerned about the situation over there, but don't worry too much. Wow, it's a particularly interesting. You just visited China, uh, so what you said certainly is very relevant. And um, you know, people here, we may or may not uh, agree with your assessment, but uh, what you said, your insights, is very, very important. We have three minutes left. We want to pick up a couple of more questions. Yes, please, the, the, the lady. Yeah, thank you so much. It's been a fascinating discussion. Emily Jones, University of Oxford. I wondered if you could speak a little bit about the current problems with um, advanced semiconductors, because Taiwan is very strategically placed, and I know it's putting a lot of pressure on your US and China relations. So if you could speak about how best to manage the current US policy on silicon chips, that would be great. Another excellent question. We'll take one more, please, gentlemen. Yeah. Please. Thank you. Yes, uh, my name is Korean Butler from Chatham House. So in the context of the overall <laughs> diplomatic strategy you described for Taiwan, what should be Taiwan's strategy on its armed forces? Armed what is forces? the overall objective in terms of uh, Taiwan's development of its armed forces? Uh, it, my, my view on this question, Taiwan and made in China, is that we should really uh, settle our differences by peaceful means. So I don't think we should uh, think using a force or war to solve our problem because the cost will be very, very difficult to withstand. So I think the best way to do is to start negotiations with the mainland China on how to uh, find a way to avoid the war. And we, we, we should not uh, buy a lot of weapons and try to fight the war. That is not in the interest of um, people in Taiwan and people on mainland China. The semiconductor. The question about semiconductor. Do you want to answer that question, semiconductor thing? <laughs> President Ma, that, that there's another question about the semiconductor in Taiwan, the situation. Could you comment on that? that? Semiconductor, oh, yeah. Okay. As you know, uh, Taiwan's semi <coughs> semiconductor uh, industry is uh, a, a superstar. But we also uh, be, were very careful to keep the competitive, competitive edge. So we keep uh, their major uh, industry in Taiwan, but we also will uh, set up uh, uh, companies or enterprises or in other parts of the world. The decision has to be very careful. It's, it's not only the concern of the industry, but also the concern of all the people in Taiwan. Well, the time has gone so fast. We have to conclude uh, this conversation. And on behalf of the Delphi Economic Forum, I want to thank you all, uh, the audience here, but also include those who watch online, uh, either in Taiwan or mainland China or elsewhere in the world, and for joining this timely and important uh, discussion. In particular, uh, I would like to express our heartfelt Gratitude to the Honorable Ma ying for finding times in an extremely busy schedule to travel all the way to Dafia to share with your wisdom and the insight. And um, uh, really, that's a, it's a fascinating, you know, you discuss all these important issues uh, with both your prepared transcripts and also more spontaneous answer, answer some of the very important critical questions. Uh, your remarks is especially your emphasis on the Taiwanese strong desire for peace and stability uh, present a sharp contrast, in my view, with the political atmosphere and the tendency to focus entirely on the tensions and on the political atmosphere between Washington and Beijing. This is provided, certainly in my observation, a very interesting and a sharp contrast. And uh, I wanted to ask the audience to join me in expressing our uh, gratitude for uh, you. And um, I wanted to, you to have a, a warm round of applause to convey our appreciation and our respect. <laughs>